Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Eleanor Scott, Randall's Round. Of course, I don't pretend to be aesthetic and all that, said Hailing in that voice of half-contemptuous indifference that often marks the rivalry between science and art. But I must say that this folk song and dance business strikes me as pretty complete rot. I dare say that there may be some arguments in favor of it for exercise and that, but I'm dashed if I can see why a chap need leap about in fancy braces because he wants to train down his fat. He lit a cigarette disdainfully. All revivals are a bit artificial, I expect, said Morelake in his quiet, pleasant voice. But it's not a question of exercise only in this case, you know. People who know say that it's the remains of a religious cult. Sacrificial rites and that. There certainly are some very odd things done in out-of-the-way places. How do you mean, said Haling, unconvinced? You can't really think there's any kind of heathen cult still practiced in this country. Well, said Morelake, there's not much left now. More in Wales, I believe, and France than here. But I believe that if we could find a place where people had never lost the cult, we might run into some queer things. There are a few places like that, he went on, places where they're said to perform their own rite occasionally. I mean to look it up sometime. By the way, he added, suddenly sitting upright, didn't you say you were going to a village called Randall's for the weekend? Yes, little place in a Cotswold somewhere. Boney gave me the address. Going to work or for an easy? Not to work. Boney's afraid of my precious health. He thinks I'm overworking my delicate condition. Well, if you've the chance, I wish you'd take a look at the records in the old guild hall there and see if you can find any references to folk customs. Randall is believed to be one of the places where there is a genuine survival. They have a game, I think, or a dance, called Randall's Round. I'd very much like to know if there are any written records, anything definite. Not if you're bored, you know, or don't want to. Just if you're at a loose end. Right, I will, said Haling, and there the talk ended. It is unusual for Oxford undergraduates to take a long weekend off in the Michaelmas term with the permission of the college authorities. But Haling, from whom his tutor expected great things, had certainly been reading too hard. The weather that autumn was unusually close and clammy, even for Oxford, and Haling was getting into such a state of nerves that he was delighted to take the chance of getting away from Oxford for the weekend. The weather, as he cycled out along the Woodstock Road, was moist and warm, but as the miles slipped by and the ground rose, he became aware of the softness of the air, the pleasant lines of the bare, sloping fields, the quiet of the low, rolling clouds. Already he felt calmer, more at ease. The lift of the ground became more definite, and the character of the country changed. It became more open, bleaker. It had something of the quality of moorland, and the little scattered stone houses that had the air of being one with the earth, that is the right of moorland houses. Randall's was, as Haling's tutor had told him, quite a small place, though it had once boasted a market. Round a little square space, grass-grown now, where once droves of patient cattle and flocks of shaggy Cotswold sheep had stood to be sold, were grouped houses, mostly the 17th or early 18th century, made of the beautiful mellow stone of the Cotswolds, and Haling noticed among these one building of exceptional beauty, earlier in date than the others, long and low, with a deep square porch and mullioned windows. That's the Guildhall Morelake spoke of, I expect, he said to himself as he made his way to the Fleming Hand Inn, where his quarters were booked. Quite a good place to look up town records. Queer how that sort of vague rot gets hold of quite sensible men. Haling received a hearty welcome at the inn. Visitors were not very frequent at that time of year, for Randall's is rather far from the good hunting country. Even a chance weekender was something of an event. Haling was given a quite exceptionally nice room, or rather, pair of rooms, for two communicated with one another, on the ground floor. The front one, looking out onto the old square, was furnished as a sitting room. The other gave on to the inn yard, a pleasant cobbled place surrounded by a moss-grown wall and barns with beautiful lichened roofs. Haling began to feel quite cheerful and vigorous as he lit his pipe and prepared to spend a lazy evening. As he was settling down into his chair with one of the inn's scanty supply of very dull novels, he was mildly surprised to hear children's voices chanting outside. He reflected that Guy Fawkes Day was not due yet, and that in any case the tune they sang was not the formless huddle usually produced on that august occasion. 
This was a real melody, rather an odd, plaintive air, ending with an abrupt drop that pleased his ear. Little as he knew folklore, and much as he despised it, Halen could not but recognize that this was a genuine folk air, and a very attractive one. The children did not appear to be begging. Their song finished, they simply went away. But Halen was surprised when some minutes later he heard the same air played again, this time on a flute or flageolet. There came also the sound of many feet in the market square. It was evident that the whole population had turned out to see some sight. Mildly interested, Haling rose and lounged across to the bay window of his room. The tiny square was thronged with villagers, all gazing at an empty space left in the center. At one end of this space stood a man playing on a long and curiously sweet pipe. He played the same haunting plaintive melody again and again. In the very center stood a pole, as a maypole stands in some villages, but instead of garlands and ribbons, this pole had flung over it the shaggy hide of some creature like an ox. Halen could just see the blunt, heavy head with its short, thick horns. Then, without a word or a signal, men came out from among the watchers and began a curious dance. Halen had seen folk dancing done in Oxford, and he recognized some of the features of the dance, but it struck him as being a graver, more barbaric affair than the performances he had seen before. It was almost solemn. As he watched, the dancers began a figure that he recognized. They took hands in a ring, facing outwards. Then, with their hands lifted, they began to move slowly round, counterclockwise. Memory stirred faintly, and two things came drifting into Haling's mind. One, the sound of Morlake's voice as the two men had stood watching a performance of the Headington Mummers. That's the black ring. It's supposed to be symbolic of death, a survival of a time when the dead victim lay in the middle, and the dancers turned away from him. The other memory was dimmer, for he could not remember who had told him that to move in a circle counterclockwise was unlucky. It must have been a Scot, though, for he remembered the word Wittershins. These faint stirrings of memory were snapped off by a sudden movement in the dance going on outside. Two new figures advanced, one a man, whose head was covered by a mask made in the rough likeness of a bull, the other shrouded from head to foot in a white sheet, so that even the sex was indistinguishable. Without a sound, these two came into the space left in the center of the dance. The bull-headed man placed the second figure with its back to the pole, where hung the hide. The dancers moved more and more slowly. Evidently, some crisis of the dance was coming. Suddenly, the bull-headed man jerked the pole so that the shaggy hide fell outspread on the shrouded figure standing before it. It gave a horrid impression, as if the creature hanging limp on the pole had suddenly come to life, and with one swift, terrible movement, had engulfed and devoured the helpless victim standing passively before it. Haling felt quite shocked, startled, as if he ought to do something. He even threw the window open, as though he meant to spring out and stop the horrid rite. Then he drew back, laughing a little at his own folly. The dance had come to an end. The bullheaded man had lifted the hide from the shrouded figure and thrown it carelessly over his shoulder. The flute player had stopped his melody, and the crowd was melting away. What a queer performance, said Haling to himself. I see now what old Morlake means. It does look like a survival of some sort. Where's that book of his? He rummaged in his rucksack and produced a book that Morlake had lent him, one volume of a very famous book on folklore. There were many accounts of village games and feasts, all traced in a sober and scholarly fashion to some barbaric, primitive rite. He was interested to see how often mention was made of animal masks or of the hides or tails of animals being worn by performers in these odd revels. There was nothing fantastic or strained in these accounts, nothing of the romantic type that Haling scornfully dubbed aesthetic. They were as careful and well-authenticated as the facts in a scientific treatise. Randall's was mentioned, and the dance described. Rather scantily, Haling thought, until, reading on, he found that the author acknowledged that he had not himself seen it, but was indebted to a friend for the account of it. But Haling found something that interested him. The origin of this dance, he read, is almost certainly sacrificial. Near Randall's is one of those banks, or mounds, surrounded by a thicket, which the villagers refuse to approach. These mounds are not uncommon in the Cotswolds, though few seem to be regarded with quite as much awe as Randall's bank, which the country people avoid scrupulously. The bank is oval in shape, 
and is almost certainly formed by a long barrow of the Paleolithic age. This theory is borne out by the fact that at one time, the curious Randall's round was danced about the mound, the victim being led into the fringe of the thicket that surrounds it. A footnote added, Whether this is still the case, I cannot be certain. Permission to open the tumulus has always been most firmly refused. That's amusing, thought Haling, as he laid down the book and felt for a match. Jove, what a lark it would be to get into that barrow. He went on, drawing at his pipe. Wonder if I could get leave. The villagers seem to have changed their ways a bit. They do their show in the village now. They mayn't be so set on their blessed mound as they used to. Where exactly is the place? He drew out an ordnance map and soon found it, a field about a mile and a half northwest of the village, with the word tumulus in Gothic characters. I'll have a look at that tomorrow, Haling said to himself, folding up the map. I must find out who owns the field and get leave to investigate a bit. The landlord would know who the owner is, I expect. Unfortunately for Haling's plans, the next day dawned wet, although occasional gleams gave hope that the weather would clear later. His interest had not faded during the night, and he determined that as soon as the weather was a little better, he would cycle out to Randall's bank and have a look at it. Meanwhile, it might not be a bad plan to see whether the guild hall held any records that might throw a light on his search, as Morlake had suggested. He accordingly hunted out a worthy who was, among many other offices, town clerk, and was led by him to the 15th century building he had noticed on his way to the Flaming Hand. It was very cool and dark inside the old guild hall. The atmosphere of the place pleased Haling. He liked the simple grinding of the roof, and the worn stone stair that led up to the record room. This was a low, pleasant place, with deep windows and a singularly beautiful ceiling. Haling noticed that it also served the purpose of a small reference library. While the town clerk pottered with keys in the locks of chests and presses, Haling idly examined the titles of the books ranged decorously on the shelves about the room. His eye was caught by the title, Prehistoric Remains in the Cotswolds. He took the volume down. There was an opening chapter dealing with prehistoric remains in general, and, glancing through it, he saw mentions of long and round barrows. He kept the book in his hand for closer inspection. He really knew precious little about barrows, and it would be just as well to find out a little before beginning his exploration. In fact, when the town clerk left him alone in the record room, that book was the first thing he studied. It was a mere textbook, after all, but to Haling's ignorance it revealed a few facts of interest. Long barrows, he gathered, were older than round, and more uncommon, and were often objects of superstitious awe among the country folk of the district, who generally opposed any effort to explore them. But the whole chapter was very brief and skimpy, and Haling soon exhausted its interest. The town records, however, were more amusing, for he very soon found references to his particular field. There was a lawsuit in the early 17th century which concerned it, and the interest to Haling was redoubled by the vagueness of certain evidence. A certain Beale had brought charges of witchcraft against diverse persons of ye town. He had reason for alarm, for apparently his son, a young and comely lad of twenty years, had completely disappeared. Wherefore, Beale did openly declare and state that son Francis had been led away by the warlocks in the dance, for his ring, which he had worn, was found in the field, and had been done to death by the abominable practices. The case seemed to have been hushed up, though several people cited by Beale admitted having been in the company of the missing youth on the night of his disappearance, which, Haling was interested to notice, was that very day, 31st October. Another document, of a later date, recorded the attempted sale of the field, with no name given to the place, and the refusal of the purchaser to fulfill his contract owing to the ill repute of the place, which was unknown to him when he did enter into his bargain. The only other documents of interest to Haling were some of the 17th century, and the authorities of the Commonwealth invade against the lewd games and dancing, which are a service to Satan and a most strong abomination to the Lord. These spoke openly of devil worship and loathsome ceremonies at the bank in the field. It seemed that more than one person had stood trial for conducting these ceremonies, and against one case, dated 7th November 1659, was written, Canuti e Combusti. Good Lord, burnt, exclaimed Haling aloud. What an appalling business! 
I suppose these poor beggars were only doing much the same thing as those chaps I saw yesterday. He sat lost in thought for some time. He thought about how that odd tune and dance had gone on in this remote village for centuries. Had there been more to it once, he wondered? Did that queer business with the hide mean, well, some real devilry? Pictures floated into his mind. Odd, squat little men, broad of shoulder and long of arm, naked and hairy, dancing in solemn, ghastly worship, dim ages ago. This business was getting a stronger hold of him than he would have thought possible. Strikes me that if there is anything to that old devil we left, it'll be in that field, he concluded at last. The dance they do now is all open and above board, but if they still avoid the field, as that book of Morelake seems to think, that might be a clue. I'll find out. He rose and went down to inform the town clerk that his researches were over, and then went back to the inn in a comfortable frame of mind. Certainly his weekend was bringing him distraction from his work. No thought of it had entered his head since he first heard the children singing outside the inn. The landlord of the Flaming Hand was a solid man who gave the impression of honesty and sense. Haling felt that he could depend upon him for a reasonable account of the field. He accordingly tackled him after lunch, and was at once amused, surprised, and annoyed to find that the man hedged as soon as he was questioned on the subject. He quite definitely opposed any idea of exploration. "'I'm not like some of them, sir,' he said. "'I wouldn't go for to say that it would do any harm for you to take a turn in the field while it was light, like. But it ain't healthy after dark, sir. That field ain't. Nor it ain't no sense to go a-diggin' and a-delvin' in that there bank. I've lived in this here place a matter of forty years, man and boy, and I know what I'm a-saying of. But why isn't it healthy? Is it marshy? No, sir. It ain't not to say marshy. Don't the farmers ever cultivate it? Well, sir, all I can say is I've been in this place forty year, man and boy, and it ain't never been dug or plowed nor sown nor reaped in my memory, nor yet in my father's, nor in my grandfather's. Crops wouldn't do, sir, not in that field. Well, I want to go and examine the mound. Who's the owner? I ought to get his leave, I suppose. You won't do that, sir. Why not? Because I'm the owner, sir, and I won't have anyone, not the king himself, nor the king's son, a-digging in that bank. Not for a wagon load of gold, I won't. Haling saw it was useless. Oh, all right, if you feel like that about it, he said carelessly. The stubborn, half-frightened look left the host's eyes. Thank you, sir, he said, quite gratefully. But he had not really gained the victory. Haling was as obstinate as he, and he had determined that before he left Randall's, he would have investigated that barrel. If he could not get permission, he would go without. He decided that as soon as darkness fell, he would go out on the quiet and explore in earnest. He would borrow a spade from the open cart shed of the inn, a spade and a pick, if he could find one. He began to feel some of the enthusiasm of the explorer. He decided that he would spend part of the afternoon in examining the outside of the mound. It was not more than ten minutes' ride to the field, which lay on the road. It was, as the landlord had said, uncultivated. Almost in the middle of it rose a mass of stunted trees and bushes, a thick mass of intertwining boughs, that would certainly take some strength to penetrate. Was it really a tomb? Haling wondered. And he thought with some awe of the strange prehistoric being who might lie there, his rude jewels and arms about him. He returned to the inn, his interest keener than ever. He would most certainly get into that barrow as soon as it was dark enough to try. He felt restless now, as one always does when one is looking forward with some excitement to an event a few hours distant. He fidgeted about the room, one eye constantly on his watch. He wanted to get to the field as soon as possible after dark, for his casual inspection of the afternoon had shown him that the task of pushing through the bushes, tangled and interwoven as they were, would be no light one. And then there was the opening of the tumulus to be done. That soil, untouched by spade or plow for centuries, to be broken by the pick until an entrance was forced into the chamber within. He ought to be off as soon as he could safely secure the tools he wanted to borrow. But fate was against him. There seemed to be a constant flow of visitors in the flaming hand that evening. Not ordinary laborers dropping in for a drink, but private visitors to the landlord, who went through his parlor behind the bar and left by the yard at the side of the inn. It really did seem like some silly mystery story, thought Haling impatiently. 
the affair in the marketplace, the landlord's odd manner over the question of the field, and now this hushed coming and going from the landlord's room. He went to his bedroom window and looked out into the yard. He wanted to make sure that the pick and spade were still in the open cart shed. To his relief they were, but as he looked, he got another shock. A man slipped out from the door of the inn kitchen and slipped across the yard into the lane that lay behind the inn. Another followed him, and a little later another, and all three had black faces. Their hands showed light, and their necks, but their faces were covered with soot, so that the features were quite indistinguishable. This is too mad, exclaimed Haling half aloud. Jove, I didn't expect to run into this sort of farce when I came here. Wonder if all Old Cross mysterious visitors have had black faces. Anyway, I wish they'd buck up and clear out. I may not have another chance to go to that mound if I don't get off soon. The queer happenings at the inn now appeared to him solely as obstacles to his own movements. If their import came into his mind at all, it was to make him wonder whether there were any play like a mummer's show which the village kept up, or games, perhaps, like those played in Scotland at Halloween. By Jove, that probably was the explanation. It was All Hallows' Eve. Why couldn't they buck up and get on with it, anyhow? His patience was not to be tried much longer. Soon after nine the noises ceased, but to make doubly sure, Haling did not leave his room till ten had struck from Randall's church. He got cautiously out of his bedroom window and landed softly on the cobbles of the yard. The tool still leaned against the wall of the open shed. Trusting man, Mr. Cross, of the flaming hand. The shed where his cycle stood was locked, though, and he swore softly at the loss of time this would mean in getting to the field. It would take him twenty-five minutes to walk. As a matter of fact, it did not take him quite so long, for impatience gave him speed. The country looked very beautiful under the slow-rising hunter's moon. The long, bare lines of the field swept up to the ridges, black against the dark, serene blue of the night sky. The air was cool and clean, with the smell of frost in it. Hailing, hurrying along the rough white road, was dimly conscious of the purity and peace of the night. At last the field came in sight, empty and still in the cold moonlight. Only the mound, black as a tomb, broke the flood of light. The gate was wide open, and even in his haste this struck Hailing as odd. I could have sworn I shut that gate, he said to himself. I remember thinking I must, in case anyone spotted I'd been in. It just shows that people don't avoid the place as much as Old Cross would like me to believe. He decided to attack the barrow on the side away from the road, lest any belated laborer should pass by. He walked round the mound, looking for a thin spot in its defense of thorn and hazel bushes, but there was none. The scrub formed a thick belt all round the barrow, and was so high that he could not see the top of the mound at all. The confounded stuff might grow halfway up the tumulus for all he could see. He abandoned any idea of finding an easy spot to begin operations. It was obviously just a question of breaking through. Then, just as he was about to start this heroic course, he stopped short, listening. It sounded to him as if some creature were moving within the bushes, something heavy and bulky, breaking the smaller branches of the undergrowth. Must be a fox, I suppose, he thought. But he must be a monster. It sounds more like a cow, though of course it can't be. Well, here goes. He turned his back to the belt of thick undergrowth, ducked his head forward, and was just about to force his backwards way through the bushes, when again he stopped to listen. This time it was a very different sound that arrested him. It was the distant playing of a pipe. He recognized it, the plaintive melody of Randall's round. He paused, listening. Yes, feet were coming up the road, many feet, pattering unevenly. There was some village game afoot, then. The words of Morlake's book came back to his mind. The author had said that at one time the barrel was the center of the dance. Was it possible that it was so still? That there was a second form, less decorous perhaps, which took place at night? Anyhow, he mustn't be seen, that was certain. Luckily the mound was between him and the road. He stole cautiously towards the hedge at the far side of the field. Thank goodness it was a hedge and not one of those low stone walls that surround most fields in the Cotwalds. As he took cautious cover, he couldn't help feeling a very complete fool. Was it really necessary to take this precaution? And then he remembered the look of stubborn determination on the landlord's face. 
Yes, if he were to investigate the barrel, he must keep dark. Besides, there might be something to see in this business, something to delight old Morlake's heart. The tune came nearer, and the sound of footsteps was muffled. They were in the grassy field then. Halen cautiously raised his head from the ditch where he lay, but the mound blocked his view as yet. What luck that he'd happened to go to Randall's just at that time, Halloween. He remembered the documents in the guild hall, and Beale's indictment of the men who, he averred, had made away with his son at Halloween. Haling's blood tingled with excitement. The plane came closer, and now Haling could see the figures of men moving into the circle they formed for Randall's round. Again he was struck by the queer, barbaric look of the thing, and by the gravity of their movements. And then his heart gave a sudden, heavy thump. The dancers all had the blackened, mask-like faces of the men he had seen leaving the inn. How odd, thought Haling. They perform quite openly in the village square, then steal away at night, disguising their faces. The dance was extraordinarily impressive, seen in that empty field under the quiet moon. There was no sound but the whispering of their feet on the long, dry grass, and the melancholy music of the pipe. Then, quite suddenly, Haling heard again the crackling, rustling sound from the dense bushes about the mound. It was exactly like the stirring of some big, clumsy animal. The dancers heard it, too. There came a sort of shuddering gasp. Haling saw one man glance at his neighbor. His eyes shone bright, terrified in his blackened face. The melody came slower, and with a kind of horror, Haling knew that the crisis of the dance was near. Slowly the dancers formed the ring, their faces turned away from the mound, and then from outside the circle came a shrouded figure led by a man wearing a mask like a bull's head. The veiled form was led into the ring. The pipe mourned on. Again, shattering the quiet, came a snapping, crashing noise from the inmost recesses of the bushes about the barrel. There was some big animal in there, crashing his way out. Then he saw it, bulky and black in the pure white light, some horrible, primitive creature with a heavy, lowered head. The dancers circled slowly. The air of the flute grew faint. Haling felt cold and sick. This was loathsome, devilish. He buried his head in his arms and tried to drown out the sound of that mourning melody. Sounds came through the muffling hands over his ears, a crunching, tearing sound, and then a horrible noise like an animal lapping. Sweat broke out on Haling's back. It sounded like bones. He could not think or move or pray. The haunting music still crooned on. The crashing, snapping noise again as the branches broke. It, whatever it was, was going back to its lair. The tune grew fainter and fainter. Steps sounded on the road. Slow steps, with no life in them. The horrible rite was over. Very cautiously, Haling got to his feet. His knees trembled, and his breath came short and rough. He felt sick with horror and with personal fear as he skirted the mound. His fascinated eyes saw the break in the hazels and thorns. Then they fell upon a dark mark on the ground, dark and wet, soaking into the dry grass. A white rag, dappled with dark stains, lay near. Haling could bury no more. He gave a strangled cry as he rushed, blindly stumbling, falling sometimes, out of the field and down the road. The End